Welcome to Art and Fiction. I'm Jeremy Hunt, and today I'm going to read Alan Holmes' The Rebel, published in 1961. Alan Holmes is a pen name, and is a book based on the comic film of The Rebel, with screenplay by Ray Galton and Alan Simpson. The film is an English satirical take on the bohemian pretensions of the art world in Paris. The initials of the author, A.H., are also those of the main actor, Anthony Hancock. Tony Hancock is the rebel who leaves the conformity of suburbia and routine office life at United International Transatlantic Consolidated Amalgamation Limited and the daily commute on the 832 to the city. In his East Cheam lodging, the rebel makes a sculpture, Aphrodite at the waterhole, and paintings in the style of Picasso are given absurd quasi-surrealist titles, Sunset Over Suburbia Reservoir, The Chain Pullers Left Tibia, Eventually, the rebel arrives in Paris to become a bohemian artist, and, in Smock and Beret, he adopts a pantomime approach to the idea of the artist genius, with set pieces including the invention of the infantile school and shapist movement, and attends an existentialist vernissage with long-haired poets, girls with green and orange hair, green faces and green lipstick, bearing in mind this is 1961. The rebel's action paintings, exhaust fumes on a wet Thursday night, and sodium light on a left buttock, caricature the action paintings of Jackson Pollock, and the performances of Eve Klein. Alan Holmes, The Rebel, 1961, Chapter 14. The Rebel got a cow. It was borrowed for modelling, promised to pay when the celebrities' paintings were sold. The Rebel was finding it easy to borrow during this time of adulation in the quarter. It was a job getting Ermintrude up several flights of stairs not designed for the movement of cows, but most of the neighbourhood assisted amiably, and the operation was conducted without mishap during a strategic moment when Madame Laurent was out shopping at the local epicerie. When it was concluded, it is true that opinion ran high on the problem of ever getting Ermintrude to face those steep stairs for a return passage, but the rebel paid no heed to pessimism. Live for today! All the tomorrows couldn't be worse than those that had started with the 8.32 to London Bridge. The rebel was keeping up with the Smiths and gaining further prestige thereby. Besides, it was rather nice to have a cow in one's bedroom. Homely things, cows. Every home ought to have one. With a cow in one's home, airwicks were superfluous. He loved his cow, and when he worked he talked to her, and she was a good cow, and listened most intently, and only occasionally spoke back. But the rebel had other artistic ideas sparked off by his visit to Shea existentialism. An action canvas. That was the ticket. If they wanted action, he was the boyo to give it to them. Anything they could do, suburbia could do better. He made his plans carefully, but one day he was ready, and then, shoving Ermintrude into Paul's side of the room, choosing a time when Paul was out gathering more consoling green lipstick, he got down to work. He stripped. That was an essential. Then he put on a pair of old pyjamas that were expendable. Over these he drew an oilskins, donned a sou'wester, and drew on a pair of gumboots. They were the preliminaries. The operation proper began when he laid down an 18 by 12 canvas on the floor. It was 18 feet, not 18 inches in length. He had two tins of paint. One was park seat green, and the other a fire station red. He took off the lids and turned the tins upside down on the canvas and let them run riot as far as they could go. He had some part-filled tins and these he emptied, regardless of colour, into a bucket and mixed them thoroughly. Then he got a long-handled squeegee mop, slung the bucket of paint on top of the other mess and began vigorously squeegeeing. That was the undercoat. When he was satisfied with the curious colour pattern, he walked across the canvas, leaving the tread of his gumboots behind him. It was rather an enjoyable feeling, the way his boot soles stuck into the paint and made a sucking sound as he dragged them out. So he went back for an encore. This time he did a samba. The shuffle produced some rather fascinating effects. A tango wasn't half as good, and anything as old as a valetta was strictly for the birds in result. The palais glide might have been effective, but he was handicapped by the absence of possible genuflecting partners. Ermintrude would not know the steps, of course. A rash admirer had lent him a bicycle. After some preparation, he mounted and began to ride around and round the canvas. 
leaving great loops of tyre marks behind him. As he rode, he opened tubes of paint and squeezed them out in long, vivid streaks of colour. A few minutes of this and he was satisfied. The patterns he was getting were nobody's business. Some action painting, this one. A gardening rake helped us to find out some deficiencies, and a flit gun spraying paint smoothed off a few awkward patches, and then he seduced Ermintrude with a bunch of hay and got her to walk across the canvas. The result was delightful. This action canvas was as active as any he had ever seen anywhere. When he showed his masterpiece, viewers would be overwhelmed. With a flourish, he signed it in a corner. Didn't matter which corner. The advantage of an action painting was that it was right way up, whichever way it was hung. Then he sat down, exhausted to recover from his exertions. Paul, fortunately, did not return until much later that day, so that by this time the studio was cleared up and the action painting framed and propped against the wall of the passage outside. It made the wet paint run a bit, but that showed the painting was active and the rebel did not worry unduly.